Good morning, Gateway Fano. It's great to be with you this morning. We have a few announcements for you today. Firstly, thank you to everyone who has already made a donation to the Hamilton Christian Combined Food Bank Appeal. If you haven't made a donation yet, don't panic. There is still a little bit of time left. The last day for collection is Tuesday, the 14th of December. You can drop your donations to the office during office hours, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Or you can make a financial donation in one of two ways. First way, make an electronic payment to Gateway's bank account using Food Bank as a reference. Details of our bank account can be found on our website under the Give tab, or alternatively, you could come into the reception and pay via FPOS. Any questions around this, just email office at gatewaychurch.org.nz. As we announced last week, we will be having an in-person Christmas Eve service, not surprisingly, on Friday the 24th of December from 7pm to 8pm. This service will be a certified gathering, which means you will need to present a vaccine pass, so make sure you've got those ready to go. We are really excited to be back in the building before we break for Christmas and in time for one of our favourite gatherings of the year. Finally, we would like to invite you to this year's Gateway Christmas presentation, Gloria, premiering at 7pm next Sunday, the 19th of December. This evening promises to be a beautiful offering of carols, music, special moments, and of course, the story of our Saviour coming to earth to save us, his people, as he promised in the beginning. So why don't you make a plan to invite your friends or family or connect group around to your place that night? Share this time together. You could always throw in some yum hot chocolates and some cool treats. Make it an extra special night with friends and family. It does mean that there will be no church online next Sunday morning, the 19th of December, as we will all be getting ready for the premiere of Gloria at 7 p.m. That also means then, believe it or not, today is the last church online for 2021. <laughs> what a ride it has been. So to celebrate and send us off in style, we've prepared something a little bit fun for us to enjoy at the end of today's gathering, so stay tuned. Chris is going to lead us in a time of communion this morning. So as we now enter into a time of worship, be sure to have your emblems ready. Let's worship. Where will you run my soul? Where will you go when wells run dry? When the wind starts to blow, Gonna keep this flame alive in the fading light when night is breaking. I know you will always be waiting, you'll always be there. I'm running to the secret place where you are, where you are. I'll sing to you of all. Stole my heart, stole my heart. Better is a moment. 
welcome to communion. At what we now know as the Last Supper, Jesus brought his closest followers together the night before he died because it was the time of the annual Jewish festival called the Passover. This was a long traditional meal full of songs, prayers and symbolism in which the Jewish people remembered how they had been freed from slavery in Egypt some 1,200 years before Jesus' birth. It was the story of Moses delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, and the defeat of the oppressive Egyptian forces, and a people being set free from slavery. It was their story. It was their history. This meal, this occasion, was full of symbolism and is still celebrated across the Jewish world today. As the meal was coming to an end, Jesus got their attention and introduced something new. He added, as it were, a twist of his own. He took some of the bread and the wine which everyone had been eating and drinking and turned them into a personal memorial. He was about to take a Jewish festival meal and give it new significance. Jesus wanted his followers to remember the sacrifice he was about to make by losing and giving up his own life. This is described by Luke in chapter 22 when he writes, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and he gave it to them. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. It's an aspect of the bread and wine that I'd like to remind us of today as we come to take communion. As Jesus presented the bread and the wine, he was not only reminding the disciples of a time that once was, but of a living truth they were about to grasp and they would grasp every time they put, partook of this remembrance. Bread is best served fresh and wine is best served aged. For us today as followers of Christ, as we celebrate communion, we are reminded that we need the bread of life, fresh, daily and consistently because it is he and only he who gives us sustenance, nourishment, life and the strength to fight on and to run this race called life. We need him for our very survival and flourishing. We need to come to Christ daily and partake of him, that this coming to him needs to be a daily aspect of our Christian walk. For when we come, something is exchanged but when we don't, something is lacking, something is lost. But something happens when we do. We need the fresh. But along with this, we have the aged. That in coming to communion, we are also reminded of a God who as a loving Savior chose to dwell amongst us. But yet at the same time is the ancient of days, the beginning and the end. The Alpha and the Omega, the creator, the holder and sustainer of all things both on earth and in heaven, that he is the eternal, the everlasting, and yet also it is he who came and now dwells, dwells amongst us. That as we come, we are built up, encouraged, and if I can say it like this, we are heartened and spurred on in faith as we come to the table. So as we come, let us be reminded today of the majesty and splendor of the God whom we worship, who came and died, who rolls, who rose and who rules, and we need both the fresh and to be reminded of the ancient and the aged. Thank you. Take my 
Christmas and as we conclude our Advent series. Over the last three weeks we've been exploring the idea of what would the world look like if there was no Christmas. Over the last few decades a number of particularly strident atheistic authors and voices have been very very public in their assertion that the world would be a much better, happier, healthier, healthier and peaceful place if Christmas had never come to the world and if we had never heard of Christianity. Nobel Prize winner physicist Steven Weinberg said the world needs to wake up from the long nightmare of religion. Anything we can do as scientists to weaken the hold of religion should be done and may in fact be our greatest contribution to, to civilization. Not to be outdone, Richard Dawkins went a step further to suggest that faith in God is actually an evil that should be eliminated. One of the world's greatest evils, he said, comparable with the smallpox virus, but harder to eradicate. So in this Advent series, we've been looking at what, the, what would the world actually look like if people like Weinberg and Dawkins had their way. Imagine a world without Christmas. In part one, I looked at the fact that Christmas, uh, without Christmas, our notion of time and therefore of progress and hope would actually be very different than it presently is. In part two, Chris tried to imagine a world without the impact of Christmas on medicine, healthcare, hospitals, and care of the sick and the poor. And then last week, Megan tried to picture a world without the Christian idea of justice. Christian and Christmas changed the notion of people's inherent value and equality. 
In this last message, I'd like to consider with you how Christmas and Christianity shape the world of science. As you are well aware, I'm not a scientist, so I will rely in this message heavily on those who are. So forgive me for the many references to and quotes from scientists throughout this talk. Some of the loudest and most forceful voices directed against religion in general and Christianity in particular have uh, come rather harshly from scientists. Um, as an aside, a key learning point from this sermon might well be that not all statements by scientists are actually scientific ones. But I quoted Stephen Weinberg and biologist Richard Dawkins. I could have added a number of other voices to theirs. Chemist Peter Atkins claimed that humanity should accept that science has eliminated the justification for believing in cosmic purpose, for believing in God. In a debate that Atkins had with Christian apologist William Lane Craig, he actually made a significantly overblown statement saying, science alone is omnipotent. The number and volume of such voices have led in our culture to a widespread popular impression that science is a nail, perhaps even the final and decisive nail in God's coffin. And the suggestion is that since we now have science, we can put away from us and behind us childish notions of God in the same way that we did with the Tooth Fairy and Father Christmas. Goaded by current literature and popular culture, we are pushed as believers to concede that Christianity is actually about believing in things that we don't have a shred of evidence for. The, the push and the shaping force is that it's time to give up our blind faith and accept that science proves things where Christianity doesn't. And Christians are often pictured as a bunch of obscurantist Luddites who have opposed science and scientists and that we've persecuted them down through the centuries. It's strongly suggestion that religion is and always has been at war with science and that the two are antithetical. To believe one is to reject the other. Perhaps the most famous story of persecution, the example that we are probably all familiar with, is how apparently the church persecuted Galileo when he challenged the prevailing Aristotelian worldview and threw his support behind the Copernican view that the earth revolved around the sun and not vice versa. And the popular story is that the church leaders shut down this heroic and atheistic uh, scientist and tortured him because of his uh, supposedly heterodox views, all the while quoting scripture as they did so. That story actually is pure myth. Galileo was no secular, Bible-rejecting Bible rejecting, sorry, atheistic scientist. On the contrary, he was and remained all of his life a devout believer. He said the laws of nature are written by the hand of God in the language of mathematics. He was not tortured for his research. And at least at the beginning of his work, he enjoyed a great deal of support from religious intellectuals, particularly from the Jesuit sect. The opposition to his ideas actually initially didn't come from church men. It came from those within the scientific community who resisted and resented his challenge to the existing paradigm. It was his fellow scientists who pressured the church authorities to silence him. That might never have gained any support at all except for the fact that Galileo was something of a hothead who had a habit of viciously denouncing all who disagreed with him, heaping scorn and mockery upon all he perceived to be standing in the way of progress. And he kind of shot himself in the foot when he turned his guns on the then Pope. Not actually a great career move. He was, unfortunately, and ultimately put under house arrest by church authorities, but he was not tortured, and for the most part his house arrest was in luxurious private residences where he was free to continue his research, probably the equivalent of, the, of an MIQ spot in the Ritz. To tell this story as a science versus religion conflict is to completely misconstrue the context. When it comes to viewing science and religion as mortal combatants, history of a uh, historian of science, Colin Russell, commented, the common belief that actual relations between religion and science over the last few centuries have been marked by deep, enduring hostility is not only historically inaccurate, but it's actually a caricature so grotesque that what needs to be explained is how it could have possibly achieved any degree of respectability in the first place. 
The idea that religion and science are in perpetual conflict is no longer taken seriously by any major historian of science. It's a product of late 19th century historical revisionism, and yet it is a myth that lives on for many. Not only is it true that religion and science are not and have never been opposed to each other, many historians would go even further to suggest, perhaps to the surprise if not shock of some of you, that science as we now have it rests on and developed out of distinctly Christian foundations. Sociologist and historian Rodney Stark said, not only were science and religion compatible, they were inseparable. The rise of science rested entirely on religious foundations and was achieved at first by deeply religious scholars. Numerous historians have noted that real science only arose once in history, in Europe in the 16th and 17th century. What, why, why was that? China, the Islamic world, India, ancient Greece and Rome all had highly developed alchemy, but only in Europe did alchemy develop into chemistry. Many ancient societies developed elaborate systems of astrology, but only in Europe did astrology develop into astronomy. Why? Clearly it wasn't a lack of brilliance and intelligence in those other civilizations. It turns out that the answer has to do with the image of God that those various cultures and civilizations embraced. Many non-Christian religions didn't and still don't posit a creator, but accept an eternal cyclical universe in which fatalism reigns and that the world is not to be studied but to simply be accepted with resignation. Such religions may delve into and seek enlightenment, but not explanations. The ancient Chinese culture developed sophisticated technology that included fireworks and printing, but it never developed into abstract science. John Needham, who was an expert on Chinese technology, concluded it was because they lacked the idea of a single creator who had created the universe to run according to laws that could be described by mathematics. The gods of animistic civilizations were either too per impersonal or too irrational to have sustained science. In those cultures, any occurrence in nature might simply be due to the fear of an irrational, inscrutable despot and certainly was not to be studied or explained. Even in Islam that did have a creator and a conception of God that might have provided the foundations for the rise of science, in fact, didn't. Allah is conceived as an extremely active God who intrudes into the world and on the world as he deems appropriate. That idea formed a major theological block within Islam that condemned efforts to formulate laws as blasphemy in that it denied Allah the freedom to act as he wills. In order to engage in science, a proper philosophical base for investigating the universe is required, and it's the Christian doctrine of creation that provided that base. A created universe was expected to have design and order and purpose. Man, using his created rational mind, could therefore study this ordered universe in a rational way and could seek to discover its laws to God's glory. Psalm 111 verse 2 in the message says, God's works are so great, worth a lifetime of study, endless enjoyment, splendor and beauty mark his craft. The conviction that the universe was the work of divine intelligence was the prime motivation for scientific investigation. At the very heart of science is the conviction that the universe is orderly, and without that conviction, science would be completely impossible. Albert Einstein was astounded at the intelligibility of the cosmos and made his famous statement, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. If the universe is, as some claim it to be, random, mindless, purposeless, without any intelligence involved, then there would be absolutely no reason to expect, expect such a universe to operate in a rational manner. And even more problematic, man's mind would also be the product of the same random forces and therefore wouldn't be capable of rationally studying anything at all. 
Actually, Charles Darwin saw that exact problem in his theory of mindless accidental evolution and said, With me, the horrid doubt always arises where the convictions of a man's mind, which have been developed from lower animals, are of any value at all or whether they are trustworthy. Would anybody trust the conviction of a monkey's mind if there were convictions in such a mind? On the contrary, Christians have always believed that the universe was made by a rational God and is intelligible to his rational creatures. And because of that belief, Christianity actually acted as a midwife to the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries. The early scientists of that period, most of whom who were committed Christians, believed that God had written two books, a book of words, the Bible, and a book of works, nature itself. And both were to be studied in order to understand his ways. Psalm 19 is a brilliant illustration of these two books. It starts off, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament utters his handiwork. Day after day, it it, it pushes knowledge and understanding out into the universe. Night after night, it shows knowledge. There's no place, it says, where the line and teaching of the heavens have not been reached. And then immediately concluding the portion of God's revelation in the skies, it goes to the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, the statutes of the Lord, and on and on it goes, speaking about the revelation of God in Scripture, the two books, the book of words and the book of works. Psalm, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says, Ever since God created the world, his invisible qualities, both his eternal power and his divine nature, have clearly been seen, and they are perceived in the things that God has made. And we are encouraged in the Scripture to read both books. Early Christians developed science because they believed that it could be done and that it should be done. Distinguished historian of science and mathematics, Sir Alfred Lord Whitehead, claimed that modern science came from the medieval insistence on the rationality of God. C.S. Lewis aptly, as always, said men became scientists because they expected law and nature, and they expected law and nature because they believed in a legislator. Newton... Bacon, Galileo, Kepler, Pascal, Boyle, Faraday, Mendel, Pasteur, Calvin. It reads like a virtual who's who of early scientists, and they were all theists, and most of them Christian theists. Their faith in God, far from being a hindrance to science, was in fact the inspiration for it, and they were not shy in saying so. Renowned historian Edward Judge said, The modern world is the product of the revolution of the scientific method, and it arose from the world of Jerusalem, not Athens, from Jesus and Christians, and not from the Greeks. You might say to me, well, Don, if all that is true, then why are we incessantly being told that science and religion have been and remain at war with one another? Well, it's actually the result of the very loud and insistent voices that have declared it to be so. However, the fact that some scientists are are at war with God is not the same thing as saying science is at war with God. Some musicians are militant atheists. That doesn't mean music is at war with God. The truth is that great science can be done and is being done by Christians and atheists alike. And there's no necessary connection between science and atheism. The simple fact is that some some scientists are religious and some are not. You know, between the years 1901 and the year 2000, 65.4% of all Nobel laureates have been self-declared Christians. The idea that science properly done must lead to the rejection of God is clearly nonsense. It might just as well lead to faith in God as it did in the case of vocal ex acf atheist philosopher Anthony Flew and leading astronomer and cosmologist Alan Sandage. Both forsook their long-held atheism because they both had a deep commitment to follow where they believed the evidence was leading them. The bold claims that some scientists have made that the only source of truth is science itself and that some point in the future science will be able to explain everything and provide answers for all our needs, as in science alone is omnipotent, it's not a scientific claim. That, that claim is actually not scientific, it's what's called scientism. If such claims were true, then you'd have to get rid of half the faculties at any university. History, literature, art, 
music, philosophy, ethics, all would have to go. The statement that only science can lead to truth in itself is not a scientific statement. It's unproven and unprovable. Actually, it's incoherent and self-refuting. Now, as valuable as science is, it clearly has limits to its power, and it is not omnipresent, as Peter Atkins claimed. John Lennox actually uses a somewhat il uh, amusing illustration to show the limits of science. He talks about Aunt Matilda baking a cake, and he says we can take Aunt Mac Matilda's cake and submit it to a top group of scientists for analysis. The biochemists will be able to tell us about the structure of the proteins and the fats in the cake. The chemists will uh, outline and analyse all the elements involved. The physicist will tell us about the fundamental particles involved and the mathematician will offer us an elegant set of equations to describe the behaviour of those particles. And as a result of their brilliant work, we will know how the cake was made and what it was made out of. But suppose somebody asked the question, why did Aunt Matilda make the cake? Suddenly, scientists are left guessing. We have absolutely no idea. Science, no matter how good, is powerless in the face of why questions. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs commented, science takes things apart to show us how they work. Religion puts them together to show us what they mean. Science is about explanations. Religion is about meaning. Let me, let me just press that illustration home for a moment. If I had the jug boiling and you came into the room and said, why is that water boiling? Now, I might respond by saying heat from the gas flame is conducted through the copper base of the kettle, agitating the molecules of the water to such an extent that it boils. Or I might simply say, well, I was planning to make a cup of tea. The first answer is scientific, the second is personal, involving my intentions, my desire, my will. The two explanations don't conflict or even compete, they complement each other. Christianity is not and has never been at war with science, and science will not ever do away with God. The militant scientific voices that want to do away with Christianity and Christmas seem to be ignorant of the fact that it was actually Christianity and its associated worldview that actually served as the midwife for the birth of science as we know it today. These voices, the child of Christianity, have grown up and are now seeking to destroy the mother. I'm very confident that they won't. In fact, for those of you who are interested in this subject and are interested in science, you will be aware perhaps of new areas of scientific endeavour that have arisen over the last few decades that have put the God hypothesis squarely back on the table. Now, I won't take the time, we don't have it, uh, to develop those thoughts, but should you be interested, two books that I would highly recommend to you one by John Lennox called Cosmic Christianity and the other by Stephen Meyer simply called The God Hypothesis. I think if you're interested in the subject of science, those two books would benefit you greatly. Friends, the truth is that without Christmas, our world would be almost unrecognisable in almost every field that you care to name. The scientific developments and the benefits that we enjoy and take for granted might look very differently than they presently do if there had been no Christmas. And we haven't got the time to delve into other areas and dimensions in which Christmas has largely shaped our world. You imagine just for a moment what English literature would look like without Christmas. There would be no John Milton's Paradise Lost, no Dante's Divine Comedy, very little Shakespeare, no John Steinbeck's East of Eden, no Graham Greene's The Power and the Glory, no Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, no Chronicles of Narnia, none of the brilliant works by Dostoevsky. Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago would have never been written and we would not have T.S. Eliot's Murder in the Cathedral. That's just a small sample of the things that we would lose. Music would be absolutely impoverished. No Bach, Handel, Mozart, Beethoven, Liszt, Mendelssohn, no Bob Dylan, no Johnny Cash, no Bono, no U2. Imagine the art world without Christmas. No Da Vinci's Last Supper. No Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son. No Michelangelo's Creation of Adam or Raphael's Transfiguration or Salvador Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross. The Grinch-like voices that want Christmas to be done away with, if they had their way, 
our world would look very, very different than it presently does. And I, for one, would suggest it would be much the poorer. Actually, I would go further than that and say it wouldn't just be poorer, it would actually be impoverished. Thank God for Christmas. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Great is thy incredibly grateful to God that we have been able to serve you, our community, both local and beyond through Church Online. That's right, but 
as great as Church Online has been, there are so many times when things haven't gone to plan. So we thought it'd be fun to farewell 2021 by showing you what really goes on behind the scenes of Church Online. This is the Church Online blooper reel. Until 2022, ka Not working? Is that okay? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> As a result of hearing that, that message, let's just do that again. <laughs> <laughs> do not touch me. <laughs> Please raise your hands and allow me the blessing and privilege of speaking. Oh, stop it. I know. First in a series. Uh... <laughs> that was me, sir. <laughs> Hi, Gateway. We just wanted to bring you. No, oh, stop. Sorry, I'll start again. <laughs> Kia ora, Gateway. <laughs> what? You started so high. I'm just trying to... Uh, first, we have an interview with Chris and Don, and then our worship team is with you. <laughs> Good Lord. Why can I not say that? <laughs> Now we're going to hand over to Chris who interviews Don around some of the key questions with regard to our personal devotional practices and it all... <laughs> oh! I'm disappointed myself. Oh. On that note, our first Sunday back in the building under the new traffic light system is Sunday the 9th of January and we're really looking forward to finally being together in person again. On the 9th, we will gather. <laughs> Today, oh, no, I'm just looking at today. <laughs> today, I'm. <laughs> Firstly, thank you to everyone who has already made a donation. Oh no! <laughs> thank you. Put my, my, my teeth in. This month, we're taking place. <laughs> Please allow me the privilege of speaking the blessing from number six over you and your family. <laughs> what is that? What is that? Looking for signs of him. <laughs> and I think you just just to fade out. Yeah. And then we'll have Megan saying yeah. thanks.